Hi, everyone. This is Bob Dietrich with the ADHD Toolbox. And uh, boy, we have a, a super presentation in store for you today. We're going to be talking about um, ADHD as a superpower. And this is really a cool concept and a, and a cool idea and, and something that I think your kids can really um, sink their teeth into. Um, and on the, on the line with us today uh, in the show, we've got Aaron Huey. Aaron, uh, Aaron, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing in the ADHD community, and uh, then we'll get into why uh, ADHD is a superpower. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to mm -hmm. be on uh, the ADHD Toolbox. Uh, I was really excited. This is something that I'm very passionate about, something I know intimately. Mm -hmm. uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD in the 70s. I was uh, put on Ritalin at a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter has ADHD. My wife's got it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surrounded by it. Um, in 2004, my wife and I began kids camps, uh, working with kids who just had the exact same type of energy that I did. In mm -hmm. 2009, um, those kid camps and teen rite of passage programs uh, literally turned into a residential treatment program, which is still running today, Fire Mountain Residential Treatment Center. We're in Estes Park, Colorado. Um, we're a dual diagnosis. So we work with kids with ADHD, um, uh, the bipolar, the, the OCD, the oppositional defiant, uh, kids who are struggling with dependency issues, whether it's uh, uh, drugs and alcohol or video game addiction or self-harm. Mm -hmm. Very successful treatment center. Uh, my wife and I co-founded uh, the program together uh, and have been working with, with uh, 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 teens and kids who struggle with this thing and, and mainly the families who, who struggle with this thing that quite frankly, I don't know if I can live without anymore. And, and uh, that's why I call it a superpower. I know we're, we're getting into that, but Fire Mountain, we're, we do great work. And my job now primarily is to work with the parents to help them reframe the experience of what's going on at home, create mm -hmm. new parenting strategies, mm -hmm. and get their homes back under control of their value system and get the kids playing the roles that the kids are supposed to play, which is they're the kids and parents are the parents. And just right. reestablishing those boundaries and roles that uh, – we're supposed to be there in the first place. Right. And you hear about all these different people and we've talked about it several times on, on the toolbox. It's, uh, you know, Thomas Edison and Albert Einstein and, and some of the modern ones, Adam Levine and, and um, Michael Phelps. And, and I'm sure the parents are wondering, when does that come through? Right. <laughs> when, when do I get to see that part of my child? Because I know it's in there and they can see it because they live with the child. They can see these, these glimpses yeah. of brilliance and, and then, the, and then it's, they're overwhelmed by, the behaviors. And so, um, you know, how, how do you see the superpower when you've got that going on? That's such a great question. And what a, what a powerful way to begin is, and I will say, you'll see it the, the moment you start nurturing it, you know, as long as you're creating it as something that you have to press up against or something that your child has to downplay or the, the constant, my memory of being ADHD was the constant reinforcement of sit down, be quiet, hold still, you know, wait your turn, these types of things. And I'm not saying that your ADHD kid has to be first and loudest and always the attention has to go there, but there were ways, and my mom was really, really good and therefore training my dad, um, we got really, really good at getting me into the environment that allowed me to utilize what ADHD gave me. And let me, let me be clear, to me and to a lot of professionals, this is the definition of ADHD that I love. It's not that I can't pay attention. It's that I pay attention to everything equally at the same time. My brain does not prioritize the right. information coming in. If right. I'm driving, the conversation I'm having is just as important as what's happening on the road, is just as important as that eagle that just flew overhead, is just as important as that cup that's rolling around on the, on, and my brain takes it all in. That's the warrior brain. If I'm stalking an environment, if I'm looking to protect a community, if I'm a detective, if I'm a nurse, if I'm a teacher, I've got to pay attention to everything at once. I cannot compartmentalize my focus. Everything's got to be going on and I got to take it all in and process the information so that I know where to put the energy. It excels me on stage because I can 
read, feel, and sense the audience. It helps me with martial arts because I can not only can I watch the person's stance and watch where their eyes go, it helps me with uh, reading their micro expressions and their larger body language. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps me with emergency medicine. It helps me with outdoor survival. And my three favorite hobbies are outdoor survival, emergency medicine, and mar martial arts. Mm -hmm. So my parents put me in hockey. And I was the goalie and being the goalie means you're watching everything at once and you're noticing the placement and that puck sliding. And I did a good job. My parents put me into soccer where it was a constant running game and I was constantly trying to figure out where the ball was going to be, not where it is. The moment you start to nurture the environment of the child's ADHD brain is the moment they start to flourish. Bob, I'll tell you, when I am sitting in a place and I'm trying to do work and it's quiet and all I'm focused on is this one thing I'm doing, I am so bored. What I got to have is I got to have heavy metal music going on in my head and I got to have a little window of a YouTube video plan. And then I got to have my work in front of me and be in a coffee shop where I can people watch. That's the speed that my brain moves. That's the speed where I'm most efficient and for people to say, you can't do that, you got to focus, you got to bring it down. It doesn't work for me. I got to be in the environment that works for my brain. Mm -hmm. And the moment parents start to make a concerted effort to create the environment that their child flourishes in, that low self-esteem, the, the low self-concept, all those things start to fall away. And the child starts to say is, you know what? I'm designed for this moment. This moment belongs to me. And I have found myself in many precarious situations in my life where truly without my ADHD, I don't know if I ought to survive. They're not all good. Let's, let's be clear. I was a drug addict for 14 years. Uh, I struggled in school tremendously. Um, but there are environments in my life where if it wasn't for my diffuse awareness, uh, I don't think I'd have made it. Like, you know, let me give you an example. This, this is one of my favorite examples. I'm walking down the streets in Barcelona, which is well known for pickpockets, especially in, in the Ramblas. And I'm walking down, I'm holding my wife's hand and my daughter and her fiance are in front of me and we're walking down and I'm watching this guy pickpockets. And it's because I noticed him. He was moving differently than the rest of the environment. My eyes were drawn. I'm watching him pick pockets. He sees me look at him, makes a 90 degree turn into a store. And the first thing my daughter says is, dad, did you see that? And I was like, yeah, she got the superpower. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop there and leave some space for questions. But that's what I'm talking about. I, I love my superpower now. And Look, folks, I run four different businesses, and that sounds like too much for anybody, but it's enough for me. Does one pot get cooked to completion? No. No. I, because I got four things cooking at once, I'm constantly shifting gears. I can't focus on one. But if you try to get me to focus on one, I'm going to fail it. And if you put me in an environment where I'm going to fail, how could I thrive? If you try to teach a fish that riding a bike is the key to success, the fish is going to fail. Put me in the ocean and let me swim. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, so basically what you're saying is, is when you see what the child is good at, when you see what they thrive at then nurture that, and that will help that, that brilliance come through. And isn't that true with us as adults? Like how much time do we spend in our lives trying to say uh, these things that I suck at, I gotta, I gotta get better at. And we, and we, we look, being well-rounded is something that we think we should teach kids. We think we should teach kids to be well-rounded and be able to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But then we grow up to be adults and our goal is to specialize. Mm -hmm. Discover the master's path at an early age. Discover your child. And they're going to switch, especially if they got ADHD. They're going to switch paths. Right. Let them move. The moment they commit to hockey, it might change in a few weeks. Yeah, you got to teach them to follow through and finish. But allow them to have a changing focus. Allow and there's some places that having a changing focus isn't healthy. For example, video games on a developing brain. That's not conducive 
We still have to use nature. We still have to use the environment in which we have evolved in and not try to superimpose that natural environment with these prefabricated environments with random goal and reward systems put into play that are designed to get you hooked on the game. That will feel like thriving for an ADHD kid, but in truth, it's stimulating the limbic system and not helping them do anything but survive a chaotic environment with the expectation that doing so will provide reward. That's a longer conversation about tech dependency, but I want to start out the gate out of this gate saying video games are not helpful to kids with ADHD. There are uh, uh, times and places for social media and there's, there's research coming out that shows an hour a day of social media does help an adolescent brain thrive, but that is a limited hour per day and then it goes off and the kid, so you got to find the real research for what's taking place. <clears throat> but I'll tell you in nature, I see it all. I take it all in. I am seeing animals moving that other people don't know that are there. My, my survival training is always kicking in. I'm daydreaming at the same time that I can follow the path of an animal that no one else can see because the animal wasn't there except for yesterday. And right. putting an ADHD kid into um, first, uh, first aid and CPR classes where they have to learn how to uh, take in an entire environment that's in crisis. Right. It's a great place for them. So really find the environment that's conducive to a brain that is diffuse aware. Got it. Got it. You know, um, as you're talking, it occurs to me um, that, that you had a turning point and I'll bet it was a powerful turning point. Uh, in your life where, where you shifted from the behaviors um, uh, and, and the, the, the self-destructive behaviors into something that was, um, uh, that, well, that, that's made you who you are today. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, um, and a, about the turning points that other kids might be able to, to learn from that so they can shift earlier in life and not have to go through some of the struggles you went through? Yeah, you know, that's, that's such a powerful and potent question because, you know, like a lot of people who struggled with addiction, my turning mm -hmm. point came at a rock bottom moment mm -hmm. where that in, uh, inability to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I grew up without con connection with my biological father. I was sexually assaulted at the age of 18. Um, I, had, I was bullied extensively as a, as a child in, in middle school. And I was in middle school in the early, early 80s. So we were still dealing with kind of an old, old version of what happens in school and what's appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of pain growing up. I had a lot of sadness growing up. When I discovered marijuana, I very basically discovered that when I was high, I was happy. And when I was sober, I was sad. Mm -hmm. And who wants to live life sober? or sad. Right. Um, so 14 years later, uh, uh, you know, struggling and, and, and using and continuing to isolate more and more from society and, and create an environment mm -hmm. for me that I thought was thriving. Mm -hmm. And truly it wasn't. Truly the adventure was going on in my head while I wasn't leaving the couch. Um, but my, my sober moment was really the turning point where I said, okay, I have all these things that are not going to go away. Um, and I have all these things that I can learn how to cope with and deal with. And I have these things that I got to learn how to leverage, but that was at 28 years old. Right. So as a, as a parent dealing with a the child, there is a careful balance of learning how to um, manage and create rock bottom experiences for your child and allow them to focus on the natural consequences of their actions. And while it looks like an ADHD kid doesn't care and is just moving on to the next shiny object, we do learn. We, we do learn and we do remember. Um, so it is, it is about finding that balance with your child letting them experience the natural consequences of their actions, not your emotional consequences. Emotions don't, other people's emotions, uh, as, a, as a parent, your leverage, the leverage of your emotional consequences to your children end um, at around 12, 13 years old. Like they just don't hold weight for a developing adolescent brain anymore. 
So you have to find the natural consequences. And they're really, really, if, if you're a parent and you want to help your child manage the transition of, of curse to gift of this ADHD, then you have to learn how to switch from protecting your child to preparing your child. Protecting your child from the real world is what you do when your children are little. Mm -hmm. Preparing your child for the real world is what you do when they hit around 13, 14 years old, when they can handle the conversations around, hey, um, what do you think the Taco Bell manager would do if mm -hmm. you did this at Taco Bell? Punching a hole in the wall because you're angry, doing that at Taco Bell, what do you think would happen? And they're going to say things like, I don't care, and it doesn't matter, and I'll beat up the Taco Bell or ignore you. Or, But these, these things do land. And if parents can't remember that even with an ADHD kid, what you model will land harder and last longer than what you say, then that, that's how we teach children, by mm -hmm. what we model, by what we do. Even the ADHD kids are watching their parents. And realizing that certain things work in the world and certain things don't. What parents forget is that as an adolescent, every single one of them, not just the ADHD kids, but every single kid has to separate from the adult value system so that they can experience what life is like based on the value systems they're trying to create through self-identity. Yeah. We all tend to return to a version of our parents' value system. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because, uh, you know, one of our uh, speakers, Susie O'Hare, uh, she's from Australia, and um, uh, she had uh, a child with, a, has a child with ADHD, and she said that <clears throat> once her child, um, uh, once she shifted and she worked on herself, her child completely changed. And and I, don't, I think a lot of parents look at this as a, um, child problem, but but over and over again in these interviews we've been doing in the toolbox, it's becoming uh, obvious that it's not a child problem; it's a family issue, and it's it's a a family solution as well because it's not just the child that that needs to work on themselves to overcome these things, but it's also the parents. And uh, do you see that with your treatment center as well? Oh my God! I I mean, Bob, that is that is literally the the core foundation of who we are at Fire Mountain and what we teach. We make it very clear to parents: there's no such thing as a broken child. Mm -hmm. This is a child in reaction to an environment. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a child in reaction to a system. It mm -hmm. could be that the system is faulty. Mm -hmm. Ninety nine percent of the times, it is identifying which system has had the dysfunctional breakdown. It is that's tough for parents because sometimes it is parenting. Sometimes it is the fact that there's a the ADHD is in the is in the genes. Sometimes it's that there was a divorce, and sometimes that there was an addict in the family, and sometimes the dysfunction is a neurological dysfunction, and the environment isn't working in the child's head. And knowing how to approach the solution through a family uh, a systemic recovery, the family has to go into recovery. If Think about it this way. If you bring a child to me and because of their ADHD behavior, they're not going to school, they're, they're, they're using drugs to, to self-medicate uh, uh, the experience of having an ADHD brain, they've mm -hmm. committed some crimes through compulsive behaviors and, and choices that are not conducive to uh, a thriving, but rather are survival choices. So you bring the kid to me. We have a series of questions for the parents where we say, number one, recognizing that there's a system that's not working. If we bring your child in, they're going to learn an entire new language, a therapeutic mm -hmm. language, a cultural language of recovery. Right. So let's just say that at home you're speaking French and you're bringing your kid to facility and we're going to start teaching them Spanish. If you don't learn how to speak Spanish at home, what do you think the kid's going to do when they come home? If the environment at home doesn't change, if the way we survive our social structures through coping mechanisms and the social structure doesn't change, we will return to the dysfunctional coping mechanism. So everything has to change. And the parents have to have the energy for that. If they don't, you can try to say it's your kid's problem, it's your kid's dysfunctional and your kid's broken and send them to a treatment center. But ethically, I would be remiss not to say, if the treatment center says it's your kid's fault and there's no changes you have to make at home, then they're just trying to take, take your money, period, straight up. Everybody's got to be involved in the recovery process. Everybody, whether it's drugs, alcohol, cutting, and self-harm, 
uh, or a mental uh, a behavior disorder, or, or, or anything. Mm -hmm. Whole family changes or nothing changes. That's the rules. That's the way this world of mental health goes. It's frustrating for parents when you think that you've done everything right. Mm -hmm. And then some bald guy with tattoos and a goatee says, actually, here's some other changes you can make. And you're already exhausted, angry, frustrated, terrified, haven't slept well. Your marriage is suffering. The other kids in the, in the household don't feel like they're getting enough attention. Now you've got to make even more changes. The answer is yes, you do. Whole family mm -hmm. goes into recovery or no one recovers. And that's yeah. how it goes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, it's ironic that you mentioned that because, um, you know, a, a lot of our interviews here have, have talked about how, um, how parents uh, and adults, in fact, when we were interviewing Dwayne uh, Gordon of ADDA, ADA, uh, Dwayne said most adults realize that they have ADHD after their child is diagnosed. Yeah. And, and, and it is truly can be a family process, uh, 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 process, but you know, just because your child has ADHD doesn't mean you do, but either way, it's still a family process, right? It's still, it's still a, a whole systemic, um, um, solution that, yes. we, that we're, we're looking for. That's, that's great. Great yeah, information. I mean, truly what problems aren't systemic? Right. Like, like when we see so many parents focus on the actions and results mm -hmm. of an ADHD child. Mm -hmm. And that's where we fall into the first trap because what's going on underneath actions and results are feelings, thoughts, and experiences. Experiences mm -hmm. is the bottom thing. The experience might be a dysfunctional experience like abuse or abandonment or right. assault. Right. And then right. above that are the way we think about the world. And if my base experience, my base value experience has that is that my brain does not focus on one thing at any point in time, then my thought process is going to be different. And if my thought process is different from yours, you can bet my feelings about the world are different than yours. And if my feelings are about the world, we have to remember that children do not separate feeling and actions. Adults are supposed to. We possess the developmental ability to separate feelings and actions. So my boss makes me angry instead of smacking him or punching a hole in the wall. I'm going to do some breathing exercises. I'm going to calm down, go home and talk to the husband. And then tomorrow I'll go back to work and have a conversation with him. Kids don't possess that ability. I'm not talking about ADHD kids either. I'm talking about kids. And so feelings and actions are connected even if we're an adult with a fully de developed brain, but with kids, they are uh, inseparable. How you feel is what you do as a child. And the results come from what actions you take in life. Mm -hmm. Parents focus on actions and results. Therapy requires us to dig deeper into feelings, thoughts, and ultimately we can start to reveal the base value experience. Is there a defunctional brain chemistry? Is there a defunctional social system in play? <clears throat> is it environmental? Is it neurological? And how can we begin treatment of the values of the base experience of life? How can we reframe ADHD so it's not this thing that is causing your kid to fail school and your kid's suffering from it? Rather, your kid has it and is able to utilize it to the best of their ability. No child will be able to figure that out. Parents have to do it for the kids and then help the kids say, yeah, I know the doctor said you have ADHD and I know it's different than how schools are teaching. Not all schools are able to handle. You don't have PE, you don't have recess. So there's no way an ADHD kid is going to thrive in school. You can't play music. You're, you're, there's no choir. There's no funding for arts programs. Sorry, kids, school's not designed for you. But after school's your time. And here's what we're going to do from 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock. This is what we train parents in, is that recreating the home life, recreating mm -hmm. the, the, the parental value system will affect the kids tremendously. And the kids' lives will change. And what was the wound will become the gift. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. So... You deal a lot with, uh, you, I mean, you have a treatment center, so you deal a lot with kids that are already, um, uh, they've got some challenges or behaviors that are showing up. It could be drug abuse, it could be cutting, it could be something like that. Um, what do you say to the parents 
where their kids haven't gotten there. They're, they're, they haven't, but it, you know, it could trend there. I mean, it, it may happen in the future. May, you know, their kids may be seven or five, or they may be 12 or 13. Uh, but you want to, you know, you're, you're, you're a parent, you're watching this, you're going, I don't ever want to get there. What do I do to make sure that that never happens? Yeah, that's, that's awesome because it, that is the goal of everything I do outside the facility. Right. Right. Facilities and residential treatment and outpatient programs are these it, it, pounds of cure. And pounds of cure are expensive, right. physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. Mm -hmm. The pound of cure is expensive. So if you're, my whole goal outside of the treatment program is to be that ounce of prevention. That's why I do the podcast, Beyond Risk and Back, is because I want parents to have all the information that we use, that the experts have on children uh, who are suffering from this stuff. Right. If you cannot change the home life now, when your kid's still five and seven and struggling in an environment that is not conducive to ADHD, if you can't change the stuff now, I want you to imagine how hard it will be after your child's self-concept has already struggled to the point that they've tried to commit suicide three times. They're using drugs on a regular basis to cope with the feelings of inadequacy and failure that they are that is being reinforced in their lives every single day. The idea that now they're medicated so that they can deal with their ADHD quite frankly, can set up a feeling that the only way you can handle life is when you're on meds. That was, that was true for me. I'm not going to say that's true for everybody, but that was true for me. If I wasn't normal, unless I was on Ritalin, that set up a thought process for me that did not help me in life. So when your kid is five to seven years old, when your kid is nine and you're looking at this young boy and you're like, I like, it's just not working in the, real world for this kid, then you've got to help recreate the world for your child. It's your job. And just to think, to think that indulging a child's ability to thrive in the environment that's going on up here is going to be a detriment to them later. That's just us as adults falling prey that there is a way things should be and should is the killer word. That word should. Oh, it shouldn't be this and it should be that. And my child should make better choices. Right. The moment you're there, you're setting up expectations and expectations are the root of suffering. You have to take a step back and say, what kind of life? is gonna be perfect for this kid. A kid with ADHD makes an incredible firefighter, paramedic, military personnel, nurse, teacher, uh, lawyer, detective, uh, police officer. These people, look, I teach an entire uh, uh, a workshop around archetypes and archetypal behavior. This is the warrior. And what warriors do in life is find something so important that they dedicate everything they do to it. What does it mean to be a warrior? It means you love something so much you're willing to die for it, that you're willing to fight for it, that you're willing to live for it, that it becomes a code of, of behavior for you, like a chivalric code or the, or, or the, uh, um, the hagakuri, the, the, the bushido for the samurai. It becomes this thing that is the focal point of your life. Maybe it's animal rescue. Maybe it's orphans. Maybe it's addiction and recovery. Maybe it's fighting fires or keeping the peace or teaching children. Or, But that, that ADHD kids, they're the warriors and they're one fourth of the culture. They're one fourth of society. They're not going to become engineers that can focus on a single problem in a single part so that that big thing can, can finish. They're not going to be the, the, the doctors who can, who can isolate a, a singular molecule that's out of place that they can treat, these are the people who are going to become business entrepreneurs and they're going to own real estate and they're going to run multiple companies and they're going to win some and lose some. These are going to become professional athletes that can see everything going on the field. There is a life for people with ADHD. It's not outside the norm. It's not outside the, the, uh, the mundane. It's not average or above average. One fourth of the world is set up for people like me to thrive. The only problem is, is that school isn't. 
unless you find some amazing school that says 10 minutes of math and five minutes of jumping around, which my brother, who's an elementary school teacher, it's exactly what he does. He's teaching for 10 right. minutes, the alarm right. goes off on the table and every kid is standing up doing it. Uh -huh. Create the world for your child until your child can learn how to create their own environment to succeed in. Got it. So, so it sounds like, you know, in summary, uh, is that you want to, uh, the environment for an ADHD child is so, so important. And because it always goes back to that. And at home, um, which is the part you have control, because you don't have much control over the school part of it, uh, unless you put them in, you know, a different school. Um, at home, create the environment that nurtures the ADHD brain, keep them involved, keep them active in other things mm -hmm. for her. And, um, and that, that is the key to keeping them away from these other self-destructive lifestyles that, that they could potentially choose as they move, um, as they move into teen and adult years. Yeah, I, I, learning that the environment at home is perfect for the energy you possess. Does that mean that everybody in the family have to make changes? Yes, it yeah. does. It yeah. means that everybody plays a part in recreating a successful environment for your child that you love and adore. Yeah. Um, and that's easier said than done. Right. And so there, there, there are, there are ways to teach it. There are ways to learn it. There are ways to practice it. There are ways to also say to the ADHD kid, that part was for you. This other part is for your sister. And we're going to focus on the sister. Now I know that feels so boring for you, mm -hmm. but it's how your sister's brains works versus how your brain works. And they're both amazing, but now it's time for us right. to be wizard, not warrior. So let's go practice. And, and that's great that, that, that you mentioned that because that, my next question was, well, what about the other child? What about the sibling who is an ADHD and, and feels maybe victimized or, or something like that, where they're, they're like, I'm, I'm not going through this. Why do I have to suffer through this issue or whatever, this problem? And, yeah. you know, how, how do parents work with the, the, the other child? You know, this is something that I only know is appropriate and how to do because my mom and dad did it so well for my two younger brothers. I was a loud, obnoxious, aggressive, overbearing, overwhelming kid. And my parents still were able to create an environment for both of my younger brothers for them to thrive. Both of my younger brothers are also very successful and very um, focused. And they're, they're not like me. They're, they're like themselves. And my, right. my parents always nurtured individuality. And we had different interests. So we'd, my two younger brothers shared interests more than I did. They loved, they both loved skateboarding and mastering one thing at a time and mountain biking, and doing those things while I was, while I was out. And me and my younger brothers shared a, a, a love of hockey and me and my middle brother shared a love of Legos. Like the, my parents did really well at saying everybody's different. Mom's different than dad. Dad's different than youngest. Youngest is different than middle and middles. And that's awesome. That is so cool. And what could we learn from each other? I, I hold both my mom and dad in such high esteem for how they handled the home environment. I was not an easy kid and they, they worked hard. They made dietary changes. Families, ADHD is connected to diet and what's going on in the gut is going right. on in the head. Right. And so make sure you get with a professional dietitian to figure out how to change the diet at home that is conducive to the ADHD brain. Right. Should a family medicate? Not up to me. That's up. That's between you and your psychiatrist and your personal value system. I have seen success on both sides. Honestly, don't know if I'd have made it through high school or uh, acting school afterwards without medication. I, I really don't. I don't know if I'd have made it. I also regret it. I also know that it it allowed me to have friends. I also know that for me it felt conducive to the next step, which was addiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I have really mixed feelings about being medicated yeah. as a kid. And you know, everybody's different, right? Uh, yeah. uh, again, we talked with uh, Dwayne Gordon, president of ADDA, and he says, he, he, um, you know, as an adult, he didn't know he had ADHD. And when he realized he did and went on medication, it transformed him. And, and we have other people on the program that offer non-medical or non-medicine related products like neurofeedback or brain development. Right. And those work great for some people. So it's really a trial and error thing. Everybody's different and, you know, uh, and there's no right or wrong. There's just results. Yeah. Right? 
And, and there's some basics, you know, family dinners, something to do between three o'clock and seven o'clock. Right. Um, you know, there, there's basics that, that every family needs that we still neglect because of our modern society and, it, you know, prices being what they were and both parents need to have a job or a single parent having two jobs to make mm -hmm. mortgage and stuff. They're still basic requirements. You got to get to know your kids, friends, parents. You got to know the other adults in the, in the community. Um, you you got to have family dinners. You got to have after school activities and you got to have your child learning the real education, the real, not the dare BS, not the, not the scared straight stuff that has been proven not to work, but the real information about how brains work, how developing brains develop and what drugs, alcohol, self harm, sugar, uh, uh, vaping does to a developing brain, the real scientific information, not the crap scare tactic. And you said it earlier, there's an environment that you can't control and it's what happens outside your house. Your house has to become a sanctuary for your child to return to when the world is not conducive to their happiness because all children are gonna have that experience. You've gotta understand yep. as a parent what this depression and anxiety among teenagers really is. Right. And it's real, it's intense. And, and most of the kids in my facility have depression and anxiety. So the education that's required to be a parent nowadays is something you have to have energy for. And I, I'll say at the end, parents, if you're not taking care of your body, don't expect your kids to. If, you're, if you come home and relaxing, looks like three glasses of wine and binge watching Game of Thrones, your kids are gonna do a compens negative compensatory behaviors too. So you have to set the example. My parents, we were, we were at the athletic club constantly. And that became a place that I hung out after school. And that a, a good, healthy meals at home, home cooked meals around that table at seven o'clock every single night was a ritual at my house. And you have to create those at home. You have to create the environment for your kid to be able to feel safe for their self-concept to thrive and for their ADHD brain to have a home. Because I will tell you honestly, one of the biggest heartbreaks growing up was that I wasn't normal. I mean, you can see how much it still affects me now. Not feeling normal is the killer. It's the gateway. And I did not feel normal around my friends, around my teachers, and around my environment outside the home. But I knew at home I was loved, I was cared for, and I was cherished. Mm -hmm. Still trying to exist in a world that did not put value into the type of person I was hurt. Right. And to get rid of that hurt, I used drugs until drugs cost me everything. So if you want to avoid that as a parent, help your children develop self-concept with recognizing that who they are at their core is a gift, not a curse. Right. And, and that, that there is a superpower in there and that, that, that the amazing brilliance that they have can come through and let's work together to um, overcome the, um, the behavioral and, and learning challenges that they may have, the, the impulsive behaviors and things like that. Yeah. I tell you, Bob, my wife and I both having ADHD, watching us work together and we're business partners on every single one of our businesses mm -hmm. watching us work together is laughable we argue we fight we interrupt we're back and forth we're focusing on this and then we're back over on that and then it's a phone call about this how we get anything done is is a miracle and we're very <laughs> successful business people both of us together um it, this this adhd brain works for me and it can work for your kid too yeah well, that's a great place to end this uh, discussion on, Aaron. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, for, for the information, for um, your vulnerability, and for sharing your story. That, that um, is uh, inspirational, and it's I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, so uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you if they want to ask some questions or get some guidance or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to not only be a part of this ADHD mm -hmm. conversation, which is so important, but to um, connect with, with the viewers of your program. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few ways to get in touch with me. Number mm -hmm. one, every week you can download one of my podcast episodes. I have over a hundred episodes already available to you about 
every aspect of mental health addiction in children. Uh, the podcast is called Beyond Risk and Back. You can go to beyondriskandback.com and listen to the experts attack every conversation and issue facing children and families nowadays. That's beyondriskandback.com. What I want to offer families as a, is a way to learn, to not just hear another talking head, but actually connect with me farther and learn what we teach parents whose kids are in our facility. My, my facility is 12 to 17 year old teenagers. Um, we opened our parent weekend, our workshop for parents whose kids are in our facility to every parent. I want every parent to know what we teach our parents in our facility. So our parent weekend is, is free. Uh, you attend it online. You go to firemountainprograms.com slash parent dash weekend and sign up. And, and there's a link to that below here, which, yeah. which is your free gift um, uh, for, for watching this video is you can click that link below and you can see exactly what they do at Fire Mountain. Um, yeah, and it's, it, you will literally attend the workshop with the parents. It's live stream. You can ask questions of myself and our executive director, Sherry Simmons, who's one of the most brilliant women in the industry of adolescent recovery. Um, and you attend it. And our next one's uh, coming up here pretty quick. Um, so get on and get signed up. And know that we do one every three months like clockwork. Every three months. So, yeah, you can't miss it. Nope. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so they get a hold of you through fr fire. Is it fire mountain programs.com? You, my personal email address is Aaron, A A R O N at fire mountain programs.com. That's how you can email me directly. If there's any way I can support you, come and speak at your, your kid's school. Uh, if let me know, let me know how I can help. And that's why we got into this business is to help families uh, who need help plain okay. and simple. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, it, it's inspirational to, to hear, and we've said it several times on in the toolbox, and we'll say it again, uh, that ADHD can be a superpower. And I know some of you parents are looking, are thinking that, you know, I don't see it because it, there's so much behavioral learning challenges there. But uh, like Aaron said, when, uh, you know, start to nurture it, reach out to him if you have questions, if you have specific questions, um, he can help. And if you have ch children or young adults that are struggling um, uh, with uh, some, uh, some decisions they've made around, you know, um, any kind of self-abuse or drug abuse or whatever, certainly reach out to Aaron. He's got some solutions and he can help you. You can watch his live, live feeds and we can help rectify the situation and help get them back on track. Thank you so much, Aaron. This is a powerful conversation. Hard one to have sometimes, but knowing that there is there is that brilliance inside and we just need to, you know, um, um, to nurture that out, uh, it's, it's inspirational. So thank you so give much. Give it a home, give it a home and it will thrive. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you for watching this episode of the ADHD Toolbox. We'll see you in the next episode.